Amen. Join me in prayer real quick. Jesus, we just want to pause right now. And I just echo the words of that song, and it fits so well with what we're talking about this morning. And so we confess to you that we, we are not enough. Uh, we cannot do this life on our own. And God, I just pray that this morning, our dry bones, that you would make them alive. We pray for renewal this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad uh, to be here. If you're new, welcome. My name is Mark Lohman, the lead pastor here at The Bridge. And if you are new, this is actually a great time um, here in the summer. People are vacationing, but we, uh, we decided to go through our new core values. And so this will really give you a taste of um, our DNA, where we see God calling us forward from here on out. And so if you were here last Sunday, we had the, the honor, the pleasure of hearing from Danny. And Danny kicked off our series of our first value, which is being rooted in Scripture. And the tagline is that we find our identity, we find our purpose in the story of God. And one of the things, uh, there's a lot of things I love that Danny did last Sunday, but one of them that I think is like forever going to stick in my memory is that Danny actually had this really, really good metaphor of the whole point of, you know, a vision statement, a mission, and values. And he said, hey, it's, it's kind of like bowling. And, and he said, Our, the vision is, is kind of like the pins that are at the very end of the lane, right? We are aiming for the pins. Everything we do is that we try to knock down the pins, yeah. right? Now, I have also learned here the last couple of days, we, have, uh, we actually have a lot of bowlers, here in the bridge, which to me is very unique, but Dan, Phil Wiersma, we have Irene and Terry, I found out a couple of days ago. This is awesome. Like you, man, whatever age you are, you can go bowling. This is great. So I think this will even work so for, for the bridge. So our vision statement, which is in the Chino Valley as it is in heaven, those are our pins. And, and, and the way that we go and knock those down is our mission. Right? So Danny called it the, the lane itself. I, I think you could maybe even change that, even say the bowling ball itself is our mission. If we live out our mission, we will achieve our vision. We will knock down the pens. And so our mission statement is to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, to do what Jesus did. Now, if you're like me and you're a horrible bowler, what do you need in the lanes on the side? Bumpers, right? So Bumpers, in our analogy here, that's kind of what our core values are, right? They, they keep us accountable. They keep us on track. Uh, they're, they're kind of like the, the sign on the freeway that's saying this way. Like, we're going we're gonna to help you go down the lane and make sure that you hit those pins. That is the whole point of core values, is that it, it reminds us what to say yes to and what to say no to, because we can't say yes to everything and so we just need to focus on those things that are going to move us down the lane and to knock down those pins. So that is, we're not just having a mission and a vision and a values just to be well organized. But no, we want to say, hey, this is actually what we are all about. So this morning, we're looking at our second core value, which is to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. To be fueled by the Holy Spirit. And the tagline for that is that we want to depend upon God's Spirit, which is alive in us. As I've been uh, thinking about this for the last couple of weeks, I think out of the five values that we're going to go through, and this is number two, I think actually this is probably the most unique one. This is, th this is the one that I think actually will make some of us uncomfortable. And I think that's for a number of reasons. One, as I think um, the church, not just the bridge, but the church in America has a tendency to talk about the Holy Spirit, but actually not functionally believe in the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, we, we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but honestly, the way we live is really just the Father and the Son. 
And so th- this may make some of us un- uncomfortable. Uh, and to be honest with you, it makes me uncomfortable. But as part of our core value, I mean, if we look at the scriptures, <laughs> the scriptures are actually very clear about not only how important, but the role of the Holy Spirit in living out our life. And so we want to be a church that is fueled by the Holy Spirit, right? The other, one, other values, generosity, being in community, outreach, we've heard about those things, and, and we still need to do them. They matter. But I think it's the second one that is going to be really, really important for the bridge. And so I was thinking, just reflecting, and as I, as I kind of took a step back, and honestly, even for my own life, as I was analyzing the modern American church, I came to this point in the last week where I was asking myself this question. Is the way that we currently do modern-day church in America, do we even need the Holy Spirit? That sounds like a crazy question to ask, right? They're not going to tell you to ask that question in seminary and all that kind of stuff. But, but honestly, right? I mean, so think about this. Typically, and again, I'm making oversimplifications, so I get it, but hopefully you, you get my point here. Typically, church in America, right, Sunday morning, hour and a half, show up, talk to some people, you know, drink some subpar coffee, right, sing some songs, hear a boring message, there's, there's, a, there's an offering to collect tithes, right, and maybe you go home afterwards, maybe you go to Red Robin afterwards, whatever, and, and, and that's church, Right? And, and maybe if you have, like, you know, a crown on your head, you're in a small group throughout the week, okay? Now, those are all good things. I am not diminishing any of those things except for maybe the Red Robin part. However, when I was in high school, the bottomless fries, that's, that was a staple on a Friday night. But anyways, not only is it kind of seem robotic and, okay, do we even need the Holy Spirit to do those things? I mean, to be frank, it can be exhausting. Right? I mean, just, just to clue you into all the stuff that goes on, I mean, there, there's a whole music rehearsal that happens, right? Whoever's preaching is for hours doing message prep. There's people who put out the signs and the information center. There's people who organize the greeters. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, especially for us as a mobile church right now, right? Trailer drivers, set up, tear down. It, 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 Honestly, it can be, just be exhausting to begin with. And so I'm like kind of asking like, is how we do church, do we even need the Holy Spirit for the way we do it? That is an uncomfortable question to ask. But I think it's a question that we need to ask. I mean, it seems like sometimes, at least from my perspective, if you're on staff at a church, it can maybe feel like what you are is like this great master-level event coordinator. And to be clear, we, we need event co- like, That's really important. So I'm not diminishing that. I'm just saying sometimes it feels like that's all that church is. And then I go to the scriptures, and we read about the Holy Spirit. And at least for me, it seems very obvious, like the Holy Spirit is like powerful, like this, as we're going to see, like it, they're really kind of like this explosive, dynamic move of God. <laughs> and I'm like, where's that? It's in the scriptures. And, and so then I'm like, okay, we have one of two options. Either Jesus, who himself talked about the gift of the Spirit coming, and by the way, Jesus said, you're going to do greater things than I have done. That might be the craziest verse in the Bible. So we have two options. Either Jesus was exaggerating, you know, this whole Holy Spirit thing, it's a fairy tale. He's just exaggerating. Or actually, no, he literally meant what he was saying. So we as the church have two options. Either Jesus was wrong, or we're wrong. I don't know about you, but I'm going to err on the side of Jesus. Just, just an estimate. So here's what I want to do is, as we get going on this. 
In a couple seconds, <clears throat> we're going to show a video, just a one-minute video, okay? And, and there's no, um, no trick question to this video. Like, I'm not trying to do anything weird or whatever. Here's what this video is. It's of a Sunday morning community that meets throughout the world and which was started out of London, okay? So the, the, what you're going to see is, is just a community that meets every Sunday morning in London, all right? I just want you to observe them. That's all. It's just a minute long. Just observe them, and then we'll talk. Okay, now again, no trick question here. Besides maybe some weird dancing, what does that look like to you? What did I hear about fashion? Oh, I was like, fashion, okay. Yeah, passion. Now, here's the deal. I'm actually not going to get at what you guys think. But by and large, what, what do you think that is? Besides the adjectives of passion and joy? A church, okay. Does it look like a church service to everyone? Okay. Are we awake this morning? Man. Okay. So here, here's, here's what that is. That's not a church. That is actually a group of atheists who meet every Sunday morning to do their own version of church. Not making that up. You can Google it started in London. It's a global movement. I believe there's one here in Los Angeles. Here's my point. I don't know about you, but I watched that. Maybe they, well, certainly this morning, they got some more energy than we do. But is that all that different than what we do? I, I see people singing, saw some guys talking on a stage. People hugging, laughing, connecting. I know a little bit more about them. They, they'll hang out throughout the week. They do a bunch of good for the community. Not a church. Sure, it looks like a church. Most American churches that I go today, it is something like that. The only difference between them and us is that supposedly... They don't have the Holy Spirit and believe in the whole Jesus thing, but they sure do function and look like it. So this makes me ask this. Why do we look the same? <laughs> like, where, where is this power? We say, yeah, the Holy Spirit, like the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ out of the grave, right? We talked about in the song before, the, the, the seal of the grave was opened, his body came out. The same Spirit who did that is in you and I. Why do we look the same? Jesus, here's what we're going to see this morning. If you open up the Scriptures... Our value number one. The early church tells us. <laughs> Jesus tells them, you want to experience my power. You, you want to experience the presence of God. He says there's a really simple way to do it. Wait. Wait. 
Turn with me, Acts chapter 1. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 1. We'll have it on the screen behind me. So a little bit about, about Acts. There are four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts is strategically located after the fourth one, John. The reason why Acts is located there is that Acts, as the name suggests, it chronicles for us the Acts, the the physical activity, the the, the beginning of the early church. And and so one one of the things I tell people is if you're new to Jesus or if you have questions about the church, go read the book of Acts. I mean, just just go straight to the source. Let's see how they did it, right? Let's see how the early church did it. And so we're going to start off in verse 4. Before we do that, let me sum up the first three verses. Here's what's happened. Jesus, to the surprise of everyone, they weren't expecting it, he rose from the the dead, right? Just, Just a little big deal, just defeated death, no big deal. And obviously it was a big deal. It's what we celebrate at Easter, And what Jesus does after his resurrection is that he spends time with his disciples, with his closest followers for 40 days. And in those 40 days, what what apparently what Jesus does is that he kind of explains everything to them. He says, hey, now that I've been resurrected from the dead, let, let me kind of shed light on the whole Old Testament and everything I've been telling you. And really, he's doing that because he tells them, hey, there's coming a time really soon where I'm going to leave. I'm going to go back to heaven to be with the Father. And so I need to get you ready for my departure. That's that's what he's doing. Now, to put ourselves in, in, if if we were there, if we were one of the disciples, I I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to wait. It's like, okay, Jesus, like, you just resurrected from the dead. You, you, you've given us physical proof. You're, you're saying, hey, here, here's the, the good news to the world. I'd be like, boom, let's go. Like, it's go time. You know I mean, like, if, if this news is so good, what are we doing just staying here? We got a job to do. Let's go. I would not be patient. What does Jesus say? Verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, the Holy Spirit, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And here it is, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You ever go on a long road trip, and uh, if you have kids with you or grandkids, what do they ask about every 10 to 15 minutes? Are we there yet? yet? Yes, okay. It's kind of like what the disciples are doing right here. I I mean, they're they're with Jesus, and they're kind of like, man, like, are we there yet? You you know, like, is, is, is it at this time that you're fixing everything? Is it at this time that the kingdom of God is going to come in its entirety and everything's going to be restored? They're not patient. And I can relate to them. I, I, if, if you know me, I, I'm not a patient person. It would like, you know, people ask, you know, uh, if someone asks you, oh, what are your weaknesses? The first one out of my mouth is, I'm not patient. Now, it's not an excuse for it. I, I need to work on it. Having a little boy has worked on that. But part of my thing with the lack of patience is that when I figure something out or if I know, if I identify, okay, there's something that we need or want, I'm like, okay, let's, let's go do it now. Like, let's, let's get the ball rolling. Yeah, I, I don't want to waste time with things. I can totally, absolutely relate to the disciples right here. Like, I, I would have done the same thing as them. 
I think we give the disciples a bad rap when we would have done the same thing as them. They're just being human, right? I mean, so two quick examples. Um, one, so I try not to eat fast food that much, I try to eat healthy, or whenever I get food to go, whatever. Here's what I always do. I get the food, it's in a bag, I put it on the, if I'm driving by myself, the, the front passenger seat, and what happens, right? Like, once I get to, like, the second signal that I stop at, I'm smelling it. I'm hungry, obviously, so I've ordered food. My hand goes in the bag, and out come two fries. Right? Two signals later, my hand ends in the bag up again, and I got the whole fries. Before you know it, I'm on the freeway, and I got a burger in my mouth with my left hand on the steering wheel. And, and, and the worst thing is then I, I get home, and I, I want to go down on, on the couch, and I turn on the Lager game, the Angel game, whatever. I'm like, oh, great. I get to watch a sports game and eat dinner. I'm like, oh, no, actually, my dinner's already gone because I've already eaten all of it, right? And there's nothing but stains on my shirt. Right? And the, the other thing is uh, my wife and we just got back from Europe. Uh, bless Rachel. <laughs> she got so frustrated with me on this, rightfully so. So, like, right when we got into Paris or right when we got into London— Right? We, we get off a couple-hour train ride. Uh, we, we, we would get to our room, wherever we're staying, put our bags down. And I was like, great, let's go see the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, like, like we're, we're in Paris. Come on. Like, there's so many things to do. Let's go see it. And she's like, can we just put our bags down? I mean, like, I'm hungry. Can we eat? Can we get things sorted out? Can we take a breath? All that kind of stuff. Right? Same thing. Get to London. I'm like, Hey, let's go see Westminster Abbey. Let's go see Big Ben. Then I find out Big Ben, you can't even see it because they got the whole thing covered in scaffolding. Big disappointment. But, but th th that's me, and I, I get it, and, and that's the disciples. And, and so they're like, well, okay, Jesus Christ, he's risen from the dead. It's, it's game time. It's kingdom time. Heaven is bursting forward into the present. They knew their scriptures. They knew that the Old Testament said, hey, when the Messiah comes... There's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. And so Jesus, I mean, Jesus is like, hey, you guys are going to be world changers. He's like, you're going to continue my work. But how? What's the secret sauce for this whole thing? The Holy Spirit. I would also think that the disciples, they heard Jesus say, greater things than I that you will do. I mean, I would be like, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? I'm not you. I'm a messed up person. There's no way that I can do that stuff. And he, I think, would probably say, you're absolutely correct. And that's why he says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. The Greek word used for power in Acts 1.8 is the same word that we get the word dynamite from. Same word there for power in verse 8 is the same word that we get dynamite from. So we're talking about, I mean, like a, an explosive, strong, powerful movement of God's presence. And Jesus tells his disciple, hey, for you to do my work... You got to first wait. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. If we want the power of Jesus, we first got to long for the presence of Jesus. If we want the power of Jesus, if we want to be a church like that's a church in Acts, we got to long for the presence of God just like they did. If, if you go on and read the next two or three chapters in the book of Acts, this is exactly what the early church does. They go to Jerusalem, which is where they started, and they just wait. <laughs> like, they're inside this room. You know, they didn't have AC back then. I don't even know if they had deodorant back then, right? I mean, it was probably pretty bad. And, 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 and they're just waiting. And what are they doing? They're, they're praying. Like, they're, they're singing songs together. They're, they're going through the scriptures, and they're meditating, and they're reflecting on them. They're waiting on God. See, when I say we need to wait on God, that doesn't mean that you don't do anything. To wait on God doesn't mean you don't do anything. To wait on God means 
that you're on your knees in prayer and reading the scriptures. Doesn't say it here, but I, I would take a guess. I think they're probably fasting too. The other interesting thing about this is that they're not just all kind of like, you know, spread out individually. No, no, they're, they're together as a community doing this. Now, for me and my personality, I, I read that, and I'm like, wow, that seems like a waste of time. What, what are you guys doing? What are you doing for Jesus? It seems so countercultural if we think about it. I'm going to quote uh, Peyton Jones a couple times this morning. Here's, a, here, here's this first quote that I want to share. He says this, Ask the apostles what 10-day period of prayer and fasting added to their development. It equipped them with a deeply rooted dependency upon the power of the Spirit of God. And I love this. God first works in a soul before he works through it. God first works in your soul before he works through you. Pete Cesaro, who you, you'll hear a lot come the fall, when we, we do a new series, he says this, our doing from God must flow out of our being with God. Our doing for God must flow out of our being with God. See, God cares about what you do, but just like the disciples, he cares that you first Wait on him. Going back to Peyton Jones, I love this little phrase he has. He says this, without a return to first century dependence, okay? Without a return to first century dependence, we will never see first century results. Without a return to first century dependence, we will never see first century results. Coming back from our flight in London, um, I love to read, and so I was reading this book on our way home called Scattered Servants. It's about this church in Ireland. Um, their pastor wrote this book, and really, it, it just kind of chronicles the journey of this church. Don't know the guy, don't know the church, but I'm not even joking with you. As I was, I was reading this book, just turning the pages, I was so stirred. I was so moved. It was so compelling. I, I kind of wanted just to stand up in the airplane and be like, hey, you guys, Jesus is alive. No, I didn't do that. Might have been a little weird. But I was, I was that moved by it. And here's why I was moved. I mean, he's just sharing story after story. And they're not made up. Like, these, are, these are true stories. And I mean, he's saying like they have people, like 20 to 25 people coming to faith every single day. People are getting healed on the streets. Like we're, we're talking crazy stuff. And you know what went into my mind? I was like, Wow. This seems like straight out of the book of Acts. Uh, man, it, I feel like I'm kind of reading the Bible right now. And I, I told Rachel, I think later when we got home, I was like, yeah, it was, this church is almost like it's a church straight out of the book of Acts. And you know what I realized when I said that? Man, I'm carrying this assumption that that can't happen today. Oh, that's for the Bible. But, I mean, 2019, folks, we, that doesn't happen today in the church. That, that was my assumption. Man, this seems like it's straight out of the book of Acts. As though, well, that's weird. Why does that happen today? I think... Yeah, because th this leaves a lot of questions. <laughs> the first question is this. Why don't we see that power today? Why, why, why don't we see that today? Right? It's, it's a very honest question. I think the answer may be that whenever Jesus, whenever Jesus promises the power of the Holy Spirit, you got to ask, what is the context for that? And every single time that Jesus talks about the power of the Holy Spirit, it's in the context of mission. It, it, it's in the context of risk. It's, it, it, it's in the context of faith. 
Peyton Jones, the guy I've quoted, he, he says this. He says, Jesus promised his presence as we gather and his power as we scatter. Love that. Jesus promises his presence as we gather and his power as we scatter. See, I think the reason why, for my own life, I'm putting myself in this, that maybe we don't see first century results and first century power is because we're not taking first century risk. We're, we're, we're not in first century mission. I mean, do you notice that Jesus says, hey, you want dynamite? You want fireworks? <laughs> You'll be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I mean, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is always in the context of mission, which is always in the context of risk and faith. We want first century power, then we need to live with first century risk. There's a, the, the guy who started the, the Vineyard ch Church movement, John Wimber. He, I love this quote of his. He says, um, how do you spell faith in the Christian life? R-I-S-K. Why do missionaries, I, I always wondered this growing up, right? People come back from Africa or Asia, wherever, doing great things. And they come back with all these crazy stories. Man, we saw God heal this and da, 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 da. And I'm just thinking like, what? Like, I don't see that here in America. You, you ever wondered that? I think it's because look at the context in which they're ministering. There's risk, there's mission, and, and there's craziness going on. They actually need the Holy Spirit because of the way they're living. So what does this look like practically, right? Okay, that's great, cool. How do we do this? I think there's four, there's a lot, but he, he, here are four practical ways to wait on the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about John 15. You've, you, you've probably heard this passage. It's, it's well known. Carlos actually referenced it in the beginning of our service. John 15, 4 to 5. Here's what Jesus says. Remain in me. You could translate that as abide in me. As I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then here's the part we don't like to quote. Apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> Thanks for being so honest, Jesus. <laughs> right? You know, one of the things that my iPhone's getting kind of old, and especially after a year, I feel like I have to charge that thing like five times a day. <laughs> right? Battery just goes like this. That's exactly how every single one of us is. We got to be constantly charged. Are, are, are you connected to Jesus? Are you abiding in him? Are you remaining in him? Here's what culture will say. Hey, you, you want to be refueled? Hey, you, you want to get power? Hey, you want to get revved up? I think our culture says, well, you know, go on a shopping spree right? Go, uh, go achieve more. Maybe go drink more. Go stay on that really great vacation getaway. All those things are fine in moderation. Nothing wrong with taking a vacation. Nothing wrong with having a cup of wine. Nothing wrong with going shopping, all that kind of stuff. But we all know this. How many times do you go do that? Have you ever taken a vacation, a great vacation, and come back not rested? I see a lot of smiles right now. <laughs> right? I mean, None of those things will provide you ultimate fuel for your life. None of them are actually going to fully charge you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate fuel for your life. You want to get charged? Plug into the Holy Spirit. You actually want to get rested? Wait on the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here, here are the four practices. That was a little tangent there. First one, pray. Pray. I think prayer for the Christian life is the fuel for life. If you feel like your gas tank is empty, ask yourself, what is your prayer life like? 
I mean, so honestly, I mean, just do, do you spend 15 to 30 minutes a day in prayer? Here's what prayer is. All prayer is, is talking to and listening to God. It's having a conversation with him. And, I mean, sometimes going back to the metaphor of Jesus with the, the vine or maybe make it an apple tree or whatever, it's, it's, you know, prayer isn't like this thing where you just like, you try harder. Oh, I just want to pray more so I get more field, right? It's not like you're an apple tree and you're just like, oh, let me just pump out a red delicious right now. <laughs> That's not how it happens. That's silly. But how does it happen? Because it's organically connected to roots. And it receives nutrients from the ground and water. That's what prayer is. Are, are you organically connected to the Father? Are you listening to Him? Are you talking to Him? Second thing, related. This one's a little bit more foreign to us, I think, but it's, it's making a comeback. I think more people are talking about this. Silence and solitude. Right, in the urban chaos of our world, of the, of the digital age, where everyone's on their iPhone. What does it look like to unplug and just to be silent and ask for the Spirit of God to fill your life? I mean, you do this anywhere. Right? I mean, if you're at work, your lunch break, if you have a 15-minute break, at home or whatever. Honestly, go outside. I think God created nature for a number of reasons. I think one of them is to enjoy it. Just sit outside on a bench just to take five, ten minutes, put your phone away and just say, you know what, God? I'm just going to be still before you. I'm just going to ask for your spirit to fill me. The Psalms say, be still and know that he is God. Third one, this is the one we like the least. Fasting. We don't all of them. I don't like talking about fasting, right? I don't enjoy it. But the times that I have fasted in my life, at the end of it, boy, do I see the work that God has done in my life, right? And what's the point of fasting? It's not just to be legalistic and, oh, I'm not going to eat for 12 or 24 hours, or I'm not going to check social media for 12 or 24 hours, no, 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 it's to stop doing those things so that you use that time to plug into the Father, right? When we don't eat and we're hungry and we're grumpy and we're complaining and we take that time and we say, God, I, I'm not happy right now, but I know that, you know what, ultimately, you're the one who feeds me. Right? I mean, fasting physically and psychologically puts us in a posture of radical dependence before the Father. It physically makes us wait on Him. Look what my, my wife told me yesterday. She said the times that she has fasted, she, it seems like for her that God speaks to her more clearly and loudly. I believe that. You know, I think for the early church, I don't mean this as a guilt trip to myself or us, but I, I, they fasted regularly. I think there's something to that. Lastly, this is something that we're going to actually talk a lot about in the fall and, and next year. The fourth way to wait on the Holy Spirit, I think, is actually to practice a weekly Sabbath. Again, in our world, constant email, scheduling, activities, go, 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 do, 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 do. A Sabbath says... You're going to stop for 24 hours a week. And not just stop, but you're going to plug into the one who says to stop. Right? It's not just stopping, but it's taking time to spend with Jesus, with your family and friends that he's given with you. I actually think it's even enjoying some nature there in the Sabbath. I'm reading a book right now about the Sabbath. And a quick side note, this I thought this was fascinating. He says, hey, check this out. The Americans talk about the Ten Commandments all the time, right? And he's speaking to pastors, so he says, hey, if, if you murder someone, would you be kicked out of your job? Yes. If, if you lied, if you lied about the church's money, would you be kicked out of your job? Yes. And he goes down the line, and then he says this. Why is it that if pastors don't take a Sabbath that are rewarded? Ooh. I think that applies to everyone. Do you take a Sabbath? 
Same author, here's what he says. I thought this was a great quote. His name's AJ, he writes this. We have become perhaps the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, and spiritual and malnourished people in history. Wow, let's clap ourselves for that. Sabbath is a weekly reminder that we are not what we do. Rather, we are who we are loved by. Praise God. Sabbath and the gospel scream the same thing. We don't work to get to a place where we finally get to breathe and rest. That's slavery. Rather, we rest and breathe and enjoy God that we might enter into rest. So how... How do we get this power of the Holy Spirit? I think this is just tip of the iceberg, four practical ways. Things that you can implement either daily or weekly. Why? Not to be religious, not to be legalistic. But because Jesus says, abide in me, remain in me, be organically connected to me, and you will bear much fruit, and without me you will do nothing. Let me end with this. Paul says this, Ephesians 5, 18. Maybe you've heard this before. Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The message, which is a modern translation, puts it this way. I love this. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge droughts of Him. Here's what it's all, it's all about the presence of God. It's not about the gifts, it's about the giver of the gifts. Do we long as a church, both individually and corporately, do we just long for the presence of God? Do we want to be a church that is hungry and thirsty just to talk to our Father and hear His voice? If we want to see first century results, we got to wait. We got to just be with our Abba Father. Because there's nothing better than that. Do we just want Jesus for Jesus? I mean, you ever think about that? Who cares what he gives you? But I just want to be with Jesus. When we get to that moment, I think, That's when (laughs) the fruit that he talks about starts coming. I'm going to invite the the music team back up. You know, sometimes people take that verse there in Ephesians 5 where Paul says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, when everyone becomes a Christ follower, when you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit goes into your life. No questions asked. Okay. But Paul there in the Greek, what he's getting at, when he says be filled, it's, it's, it's actually an ongoing, continuous thing. It's, it's not just a one-time thing. Oh, gave my life to Jesus, Holy Spirit in, and boom, I'm done. That, that, that's actually not how it works. It's, it's, not, it's a one-time thing, but, but you, you get more and more, hopefully, as, as you get older and you grow closer to Jesus. Here's what I want to do this morning. I want to this will make some people uncomfortable and make me uncomfortable. But I love that. Jesus is uncomfortable. If you haven't figured that out yet. I want to offer us this morning the opportunity, the invitation for you to be filled more with the Holy Spirit. I think there's some people here, honestly, you've been a Christian your whole life, And you've never really had a deep sense of the power and presence of God. What if that changed? What what if we really had, like, think about this, guys. The spirit of the living God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead says, I want to soak up and marinate your body with my presence. Do we want that? If we don't, who... We're just like an atheist church that meets on a Sunday morning. Here's what I want to do. If you are here and you want, you want more of God, you're not satisfied with what you have now, 
but you want more. You say, Jesus, I want more of your presence. I want more of your power just because I want more. Could you just come down here and stand? Now, a couple, couple things here. If you're a Christian, everyone has the Holy Spirit, okay? That's, I'm not saying you need him. I'm saying, do you want more of him? Okay? I don't want us just to be doing a service to do a service. Atheists can do that. I want to provide, I want God to provide a place where we can minister to one another. I would love for us just in this time just to be praying over one another. That, that's why, just, just praying for one another. I, I don't know what Tom needs in his life right now, but I can lay my hands on him and I can pray for him and I can ask for the Holy Spirit to fill his life more and more. Can we just do that? Can we just take that risk? So they're going to sing songs. They're going to sing one or two songs. Depending on how much time I went over here, I don't know. But if you want more, and honestly, there's no judgment here. This is a judgment-free zone. But if you are dissatisfied and you want more of God's presence, can we just pray for that? That's all. Okay? Let's do that.